Hey, Redcon Trader here, and welcome back to Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader. As today, hey, I'd say we're pretty much done here. I did a full sweep off screen, doesn't look like we missed anything. So yeah, yeah, time to push on. Though first, we uh, do have a level up in the queue, so let's go ahead and knock that out real quick. I mean, honestly, pretty straightforward this time out. Everyone gets one to two talents, dependent on class. So this should just take a moment. Starting with Valen, who will first use his common talent to pick up advanced skill logic. Not that we've really been struggling with that one, but you know, I have heard the target numbers will start spiking as we push into the latter half of the campaign. So best to be prepared. And then as for our full talent, I think it's finally time to grab Lethality Heightens. Now that Val is regularly breaking that 50 damage threshold per shot, which is the threshold that should trigger this. At least in theory. I mean, we'll see how it actually works in practice. We are still seeing some odd behavior with some of the uh, talents as worded versus how they actually perform. Then, uh, as for Heinrichs, not super concerned about this one, since he is, of course, going right back on the bench, but... Well, you know, um... We'll give him something basic. Let's say Taunting Defense. I figure either that or Center of Attention are both pretty suitable for... for his hybrid counterattack build. After that, we've got Pascal. And he will first grab Prediction Protocol, since he's been struggling a bit with dodgier foes, and this should really help with that. And then we'll uh, lean back into the skill side of things, using his common slot to grab Advanced Skill Tech Use, which really just kind of feels like a no-brainer. He is a Tech Priest, is he not? After that, we've got Yerliette who sadly only gets one slot. And while I was originally planning to use it to start bumping up her awareness skill, I think we'll actually break off from that slightly because I am curious about Savor the Kill. I've had that one recommended a few times and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what you can and can't do with it, so I would like to experiment a bit. I mean, obviously it's inherently limited based on the number of prey you can actually tag per fight. But, you know, I can see some possibilities there, especially since most fights are over in a few turns anyway. So a couple of extra traps, a couple of extra stacks of exploit, that could definitely make a difference. In fact, if it does work out, I'll, uh, I'll grab Share the Spoils as her next full talent. After that, we've got Cass, and of course, we'll just completely ignore Grand Strat and continue stacking her countless navigator powers. And given that we did just switch her off to an infusing staff, I figure we might as well lean into that. So we'll grab Veil of Protection, which grants uh, an extra armor bump on her buffs. And then leaning even further into that, we'll grab Under My Protection with her other slot. So that'll be a double bump for her one primary buff. But more importantly, that's also a plus two to all of her various talents and powers that further scale off her total number of navigator abilities. With maybe six left to go, almost there. Which brings us to Adira. And yeah, this one was even more straightforward. She now has access to Psyker Terminus, so we will of course immediately take that. Again, pretty much a no-brainer. I did, however, go slightly off script with her second pick, because I was going to start bumping up her warp lore. But uh, ultimately, given the number of incidents we've been having recently, I figured we might as well try to weaponize that. And whilst perusing our options, this one caught my eye. I mean, given the number of powers we have her throwing around these days, she basically triggers a phenomenon every round, so... So yeah, yeah, um... Can't stop it. Might as well lean into it. When life gives you phenomenons, you make phenomenade. And that's pretty much it. Level up complete. A bit off the cuff on a few of those decisions, but you know what? <laughs> I'm not too worried about it. 
Not if, uh, not if this big boss fight was any indication of what we're in for moving forward. This is probably fine. Sharp pain pierces your head, and the light dims in your eyes. You smell smoke and burning. You feel a wave of nausea. Your legs buckle and your knees hit the metal floor. In that same moment, the manufacturum surrounding you disappears in a whirlwind of mist, ash, and gray shadow. Struggling against the elements, you can barely raise your head to look. Your eyes sting and burn, but through the tears you see it. A colossal silhouette rising above you. The roaring tempest is unable to shake the mighty figure. You try to get a better look at the figure. Writhing in pain, you raise your head and peer into the roiling darkness. You make out the figure's features. It is a huge man clad in dark power armor, from which demonic silhouettes snarl at you. The wind picks up, and you close your eyes, unable to stare into the face of this raging tempest. The warrior's inhuman eyes bore into you. I am the master of those who have been felled by your hands in the halls of the primordial truth. I am Uralon the Cruel. The souls of my followers return to the fount of power they served, crying out for me to cast my gaze toward this sacrilege. And what do I see? Yet another lackey of the Corpse Emperor. The giant's voice causes the storm raging around you to die down somewhat, as if the very sound of his voice is enough to make the whirlwind subside. You glance at the huge warrior and notice on his chest a winding azure symbol. The shades of blue seem to glimmer and mingle together. Where are we? What is this place? Where have you taken me? This is the bridge that connects our minds, created by the will of my slave, whose fate you should be envying. The Psyker is useful enough to me to be left alive. You, less so. This is my world, by right of blood and right of sweat. I fought to reclaim it from your clutches. And you are not welcome here. No, oh, clinging to illusions will do you no good. The rituals have already been performed. The mortals are already singing the litanies of the primordial truth, or decorating the sacrificial altars with their flesh. Kiava Gamma, as you call it, is already saturated in the nectar of the truth. The fate that awaits all worlds that would stand in our way. What do you want with me? I want to look upon the one who has disrupted my flock's duties and my master's plans. That warrior from my legion, the Fabricator Sensor, you think of their deaths as a triumph. However, it is but a minor hindrance on our path. There are other worlds that serve our goals. There are other sources of plasteel and adamantine. Revel in your victory. It will change nothing. Nevertheless, the blood in your veins whispers to the spirits that you warrant a closer look. Hmm, yes. You are a descendant of the rogue trader who swore and Conrad Voigtvier sought to obtain. By defiling the relic and binding it to himself with the tethers of the Empyrean, he was meant to become my servant, a rogue trader who would do the work of the truth. But then you interfered. Could it be that you wish to gain the true god's favor instead? Do you wish to present the corpse's relic to me and serve the truth? Hear your very blood calling, begging you to submit to me. What would be the point of futile defiance?
You're wasting your time trying to tempt me, Abomination. A man is not defined by his blood, but by his deeds. And by my deeds, I cast you from my world. His expression twists in pain as he stares at you in rage and bafflement. Pitiful insect! You dare... A gust of wind sweeps Sir Alon's figure away without a trace. The mist around you begins to dissipate, revealing the dark halls of the Manufactorum and leaving behind an oppressive sense of powerlessness. I sense the presence of another Psyker. Someone made contact with you mentally, then tried to harm you with sorcery. I did what I could. You at least appear unharmed. Can you remember what you saw? Just another one of those corrupted space marines. Like the two we've killed before. One of the traitors to the Imperium. I don't think it was he who touched your mind. I wouldn't have had the strength to go up against a Psyker from the ranks of those monsters. He might have forced some mortal to do his bidding. Perhaps it was through the same hapless medium that he sensed the deaths of his henchmen. Heinrichs looks away and frowns. Such indescribable power to have reached out to your mind at such a distance. And you know, I've got to say, it kind of feels like a bad idea to bring that up to an Inquisitor, so... It's fine. I'm fine. A little rattled, but it's nothing we haven't dealt with before. I'll be ready for him next time. Heinrich sighs you suspiciously, then reluctantly nods. The manufacturer around you looks the same as before the vision. Maybe the shadows have grown a little deeper and darker. You dust yourself off and continue on your journey through the darkness. The world's industrial heart has fallen to corruption, but numerous faint Vox signals from the periphery indicate that the planet's small manufacturing clusters survived without succumbing to the heretics. The sacred machines and hallowed lathes from those abodes have been reverently transported to the safety of the ship's holds. The fate of Kiava Gamma hangs in the balance. Ancient machinery and... Ancient Energy Core. Void Pirate Trophies. Seems a bit weird, but sure, why not? And we have two viable options here. Do things properly with purifications and mass purges. Or do things the more merciful, but perhaps efficient way. Get the planet back up and running and worry about potential issues later down the line. Which, I mean, obviously... Given how we've been playing Valen thus far, although I do think he would be wary of the potential dangers of chaos long term, I also don't really see him resorting to merciless purges. That aside, of course, the game really does kind of push you towards embracing a very singular alignment. And for our rogue trader in particular, for better or worse, I think it's safe to say that's Iconoclast. The blast furnaces are lit again! Machines once again fill the air with screeches and squeals, and mag trains of wagons stretch in lines from one workshop to the next. But the cogitators by neric chance carry alarming rumors of malevolent and foul traces of corruption still lurking in the deepest chambers of the Manufactorum. Yeah, well, you know, I feel like that was bound to happen regardless of what we chose, so I think I'm pretty happy with that. Though I certainly would have liked to get more mobile extractiums. I feel like that's pretty light for a, an industrial world. Let's have a look at our base set of options. Option 1. Restoration. The manufacturums of Kiava Gamma have been damaged and tainted by the procedures of the heretic Delphine. A known tech architect, the fugitive aristocrat Barabbas Kilius, is offering to enter the rogue trader's service as a planetary steward 
and restore the world to its former production capacity. Which would net us cursed heretical boots. Hmm. You know, I've got to say, just from reading the description there, I wouldn't have really expected this to be the heretical option. Uh, but it is kind of hard to ignore the fact that Achilles is apparently a heel, giving us corrupted souls. So yes, uh, evil is clearly afoot. So, you know, we'll just move on to option two, perhaps. Blessed are the weaponsmiths. Great trials are ahead, and we must steel ourselves to face them. The rogue trader will sign a mutual aid agreement with the quest stars of the Departmento Munitorum. These outstanding theoreticians of warfare will supervise the repurposing of the planet's manufacturums for the production of weapons and military equipment. In the jaws of linked machines and the wombs of alloy vats, soulless plasteel will take on its highest and most perfect form, that of a weapon. Which does sound pretty cool and would give us a unique plasma weapon. Not that um, we've really gotten much use out of those just yet. And then aside from that, a bump to security. Plasteel and three weapons, which we could certainly use. We are pretty light on those. And then option three. Calculating holiness. For generations, the Adeptus Mechanicus have been custodians of the machinery and cogitators of Kiava Gamma. Recognizing the value of this tragedy-stricken world, they are willing to deploy a forged cathedral on it as a token of sympathy. Therein, the Blessed Fabricator Sensor Fortron will envision and lay out a new and more perfect design for the planet. Ooh, Fabricator Sensor Fortron. I mean, the name alone is almost enough to make me want this one. Not to mention the fact that we would actually get an item that would be of immediate use. I was somewhat disappointed we couldn't actually get our hands on Delphine's axe, so... The Hand of Xenocide might be a decent upgrade for Pascal. Though it does scale off Laura Xenos, which isn't exactly his forte. Hmm. Though this would actually cost us money. But in turn would give us plus one complacency and then plus one of an assortment of goods. You know what, just narratively speaking, I feel like um, the third one definitely has an edge. Valen is a Forge World kid. He does have a deeply rooted respect for the Omnissiah. Obviously, the rewards aren't much to write home about, but the axe at least will come in handy. And then there, of course, are our assortment of other various projects to pursue. Including this one which we very notably need for a project on Janus. Though, honestly, even without that, we'd want to do it anyway. My goodness, plus 10 mobile extractiums. Yes, please. Though that will also require boosting our efficiency, so... Chapel of Enumeration feels like a priority as well. Oh, interesting. And setting up a hospice for servitors, wow. That, uh, that also feels very much in character for Valen. Yeah, yeah, even just at a glance, I am definitely seeing a lot of potential here. Oh, and uh, I believe Heinrichs wanted a quick follow-up. Let's go chat with him, then we'll, uh, then we'll break for some quick bookkeeping. Heinrichs, I've come to bargain. To what do I owe this visit? Well, I'm assuming you wanted to talk about what happened back on Kyavagama. Of course. The fabricator sensor's machine was stopped. Not another soul will be sent into the mouth of the arch enemy. In time, we will succeed in uncovering and stopping other schemes of the cult. We dealt a blow not only to the cultists, but to the arch enemy itself. I cannot help but be pleased. 
Heinrichs permits himself a ghost of a smile. So, something clearly happened to you when you were interacting with that machine. I touched the corruption of the arch enemy. Did you honestly think the experience could somehow be a pleasant one? Psychers, even sanctioned ones, even those who have performed all the rituals, passed all the initiations, we are all gateways to forces hostile to humanity. I survived a difficult battle on Kiava Gamma, one that was invisible to others and potentially fatal for myself. Oh, Heinrichs, one step forward, two steps back. But you know what? Fair enough. Not like I've been entirely forthcoming myself. So what comes next? My visit to Kiava Gamma did not produce answers to all my questions, but we did succeed in dealing a blow to the cult by destroying the Fabricator Sensor's machine. I have directed my spies to track the sex surviving leaders. I am certain that they will have useful information for us soon. Though, small. This is a victory for the Golden Throne, and I have you to thank for it. Well, you're quite welcome. Just a happy coincidence that our goals happen to uh, coincide. And you know what? I've got to say, Heinrichs, um, while I still have some reservations about your company, it wasn't nearly as bad as I expected it to be. Honestly, uh, I really kind of figured my whole traumatic backstory would come up at some point, but uh, it I feel like the game just kind of forgot that was a thing, so, you know, happy to help. Thank you for finding the time for our conversation. Yeah, no problem. I need some voice audio for the uh, outro anyway. More seriously, though, I am actually somewhat impressed with Heinrichs, both from a combat standpoint, because he performed way better than I expected him to, but also from how flexible he is, which is, honestly, somewhat surprising. I really did expect him to be a bit more rigid. So, you know, who knows? Maybe we will end up traveling with him again sooner rather than later. Oh, and look at that. We have a new contract. A small thorn. The Lamesta One trading outpost has been causing problems for Dargonus' trade for years by attracting merchants arriving from a number of systems, including those from the mining world of Flactica. If only some pirate were motivated enough to blast this station with torpedoes. I mean, that does make it sound kind of unscrupulous, but on the other hand, if they are in my territory, actively infringing my trade routes... Yeah, we'll just call it, you know, a figurative and literal warning shot. Ooh, this one's new, too. Nine weapons in exchange for three mobile extractions, which honestly sounds like kind of a lopsided trade, one which we can't afford anyway, even if we had taken the Weaponsmiths project. And then these two we're already familiar with. Those are definitely more questionable, both, um, both in terms of ethics and in terms of practicality. That's it. Yeah, let's uh, let's hit the pause button real quick. We'll do some post-op paperwork. And then I think we've got enough time to uh, strew ourselves across the stars. Be right back. Hey, we're back. And yes, as you can see here, I have done some light trading. Nothing hugely notable. Aside, perhaps, from uh, finally getting us started on the Drusians. We're effectively receiving infinite Mechanicus cargo at this point, so that does free up our holy gifts for uh, alternate use. Not, of course, that it's gotten us all that much thus far. We had to get over that initial 10,000 point hump just to get to Tier 2. And then aside from that, we are past our cap for Act 2 with the Explorators. In fact, I already went ahead and grabbed our new Tempestus Carapace. Though I think the set we already have on Abbey actually ended up being superior. And then we bumped up the Caspalika two ranks, which nets us heavy Xenomesh, a very slight step up 
for Pascal. Uh, I believe this is plus one armor deflection, but he loses the plus five wounds. His current makeshift Xeno Mesh grants. And then aside from that, we also got the Mazoa Pattern Sniper Rifle. Slightly lower damage range, but higher armor pen, lower dodge reduction by a fairly significant amount, but a slightly higher hit chance, and then only half the max ammo. So with all that in mind, I do feel like it's slightly worse than the Deadly Repeater, but it does bring up the question of whether we should ultimately start focusing on energy weapons for Valen or, or solid projectile weapons, because we have not yet taken a specialization feat, and we should really do that at some point as we get into the back half of the game. And then we uh, gained one rank with the pirates. Not that that really netted us much of particular note. We pull a needle pistol, and we pulled three melted charges, which it turns out we actually did need. We are uh, surprisingly low on melted charges. Oh, yes, and then aside from that, we also have to bring Abby back up to snuff. I've already swapped his gear over, but he's two levels behind the rest of our crew, so let's go ahead and run through that real quick. And uh, as far as abilities go, I figure we'll just grab Bulwark. That's another nice tanky addition to his arsenal. And then for his singular feat, or talent rather, um, I'm a little torn here. I'm thinking either Enduring Shield, since he almost always has temps, or Covering Bulwark, which essentially upgrades the Bulwark ability we just picked up and allows him to become mobile cover. Or Unflinching, which allows him to essentially ignore friendly fire. Though, you know, now that I've actually read through them again, I feel like Enduring Shield might be our best option, at least for first pick. But, you know, as always, curious to hear what you fine folks might think. That's it. We'll uh, go ahead and grab it for now. Even if just as a placeholder, I have saved set so I can go back as needed. But for now, the void beckons. So let us once more cast ourselves into it with wild abandon. We've still got a fair few sectors here to clear, so we'll just, uh, well, that's actually slightly more than I recalled. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. That works just fine. We've got to kill some time before the new DLC drops anyway. We'll start with Nola Septum and work our way around. The warp jump was unusually hectic. The recent attack of the scrap code disabled many of the sacred machines, whose malfunctioning algorithms showed no sign of failure until the vessel departed real space and surrendered itself to the Sea of Souls. Only the navigator's talent and tireless vigil of the tech priests saved the void ship from ruin. Nice, good work doing your jobs, guys. It is always appreciated. Got some new stacks, we'll take those. Okay, and looks like it'll be three more jumps before this is done. We'll keep that in mind. Oh, interesting. No route to Emperor's Palm. Though we can kind of make out like phantom routes over here on Frozen Prince. We'll just let future retcon worry about that. Let us pierce this septum and be on our way. Seven Prometheum, okay. We'll take it. Which bumps us up to a nice respectable 30. On to planet two. Ooh, Santiel's Pride. With a hive city. 
The Sandhills' pride hives are oozing noxious haze, veined with sulfurous streaks. The promethium fumes from the gigantic distilling cauldrons located beyond the temperature shields. Vast, endless deadlands littered with spots of promethium stations and refineries separate the colossi of rockcrete and adamantine with its crown of gargantuan spires. The heat of this system star has turned this world into a boiling but lucrative gland within the body of House Corda Protectorate. It's hard to tell what's more impressive, the grotesque grandeur of this place, or its extreme toxicity. Sounds a lot like Incendia Corda herself, am I right? Though that said, I did not realize we were actually in Incendia Corda space. Hopefully she won't mind us helping ourselves to a little Prometheum. I mean, to be fair, she did try to poach minerals right next to our industrial world. Yeah, I'd say we're pretty adamantite. If we're overstepping, I'm sure she'll let us know. Which actually leaves us with a bit more time to kill, so... So yeah, yeah, let's push on. We'll at least get ourselves a foothold in Tenebris Aqua. A mysterious sickness struck the clan living in one of the macro cannon chambers. The disease quickly spread, causing the afflicted to writhe with unbearable stomach cramps and expire after several days of agony. Before the officers could react, the neighboring clans took the issue into their own hands and flooded the chamber with carbon monoxide. The macro cannon was put back into service and the vigilantes were punished for subjugating the rogue trader's servants to mob justice. Sad, but just another day in the Emeterium. We've certainly heard worse. Put down roots. Ooh, okay. So how do we get down there? Maybe they're plot locked. Oh, wow. Okay, here we go. We've got a whole bunch of stuff in this one. And I guess we'll start with this. A violent battle is unfolding before the rogue trader's eyes. Patrol ships from the Corda fleet are tearing apart two small Aldari vessels. Once they're finished with them, the void ships give chase after the third already damaged vessel, clearly with the intention of destroying it as well. Seeing the last ship's impending death, Yuliette calls out to the Lord Captain, her voice trembling slightly. Only the rogue trader's intervention can save her kin from the massacre. The Lord Captain sent a message to Corda's fleet, ordering them to stand down. The Voxmaster relays the Lord Captain's demand to stop the battle, and soon returns with a reply. According to the Corda ships, this group of Xenos are malicious criminals. They are guilty of raiding the system's planets and robbing merchant vessels. Incendia Corda's void ships are intent on performing their duty before the Emperor and exterminating the Xenos. Yurliet sullenly watches the unfolding chase through the stained glass windows of the captain's bridge. She grimly concedes that no crime should go unpunished, except her kin are, were, flying transport ships. It would have been impossible for them to raid a ship, let alone launch a planetary raid. Vessels such as theirs simply lack the firepower to do so. The Monkey are lying. Despite the presence of some weaponry, the Xeno ship is more likely meant for transporting cargo, or the Xenos themselves, rather than direct combat. Upon learning this, the Lord Captain once again contacted Corda's fleet and ordered them to stand down, lest the rogue trader himself should intervene. Unwilling to engage in open battle against the flagship of a foreign dynasty, the patrol reluctantly leaves its prey and retreats to the edge of the system. Huzzah! 
Meanwhile, the wounded Xeno ship is rapidly distancing itself from the recent battlefield, attempting to hide in the shadow of the nearest world. Every attempt to contact it is met with frustration, and the Voxmaster reports that the vessel is in deplorable condition. Who knows how much more the Xeno technology can endure before the irreparable happens. The Aldari are too scared and resentful of the Monke for the recent deaths of their kin to answer incoming hails. Despite this, Yurliette is certain that she can convince them to cooperate with the Elentech if she is allowed to speak with them. I don't know if you really want to do that, Yurliette. I mean, then you'll feel personally responsible for the inevitable. But, I mean, I'm not exactly seeing much in the way of other viable options here. Pretty much everything here is guaranteed to see them to a grim end. Yeah, that seems about right. Yurliette appeals to her kin's wisdom, but the words of the outcast cannot make them trust Monke. The pain of loss fills the Eldari hearts. Only recently did the humans destroy two vessels of the children of Asurion, and now they offer aid? Worse, they offer aid through the mouth of their captive sister. No, the Eldari will not fall for this trick. Trying to outpace the pursuit of the next Monkey vessel, the Eldari overload their void ship's drives. One of the damaged engines is unable to bear the strain. Before the eyes of a hundred officers, the Xeno ship flashes a fiery light blue through the stained glass windows as thousands of tiny shards disperse across the system. The bridge officers openly rejoice, offering prayers to the Emperor. Today the Expanse is cleaned of more filth, the enemies of humanity. What is this if not his providence? Maybe not the best time. And only the thin figure of the Aldari stands motionless against the backdrop of the intricate stained glass windows, mourning the fallen in solemn silence. Once the pain in Yurliette's soul is numbed, she turns to the Lord Captain and nods. A short gesture of gratitude for their attempt to save those who could hardly be saved. Yeah, I wouldn't sweat it, Yurliette. I'm, I'm pretty sure even if you had succeeded at that check somehow... They would have still found some way to get themselves killed. That does seem to be the recurring trend for this, uh, this particular companion quest. Sometime after, Yurliette comes to the Lord Captain, haggard, still holding on to hope. She says that she came aboard the Monkey vessel and set off into the darkness in hopes of finding her kin, but found only corpses slaughtered by humanity's hatred. And though she and the Lord Captain were not always in agreement, the Elentek still tried to lend a helping hand. In gratitude, as she promised, she shares the coordinates of her kin's cache. Oh, nice. I forgot that was even a thing she had promised. So, uh... So where do we go for that? Ah, last chance of Cyrene, gotcha. Oh, yes, we still have to do this as well. I'm fairly certain that's the far side of the star map, so... Again, definitely something for future retcon to worry about. But for now, let's uh, clear these planets real quick. Uh, you know what? On further reflection, perhaps we had best hold off on this until next time. Feels like we've actually got a fair bit left to do here. Might as well cluster it all together. An interesting episode. I mean, obviously we met Earl on the Cruel. No doubt a high-end antagonist for later down the line. Surprised he wasn't voiced, considering they actually went through the trouble of giving him a portrait. You'd really expect him to have a, a voice to go with it. And then, of course, we also got our new colony going. We got some general exploration done. Though, uh, I feel like Sandhill's Pride is definitely a location we'll have to revisit later down the line as well. 
the fact that it's named and that we couldn't actually do anything there certainly implies it's currently just a placeholder. Much in the same way we saw named planets over in um, Winter Scales Realm. I imagine we'll have reason to revisit once we hit Act 3 or 4. That said, we'll uh, hit the pause button for now. I'll get this packed up and ready to go, and we will pick up here next time. We've barely broken the surface of Tenebris Aquae. Who knows what we'll find with a deeper dive. See you then. Oh, and special thanks to the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible, including but not limited to Eerie V23, Revenant, Eloise, Dragon Matrix 7, Dracoth, Egon Alter, Excelsior, Goat League, James Treme, Kazor, Mark Jemsa, Nathan Welch Jr., Overlord Farah, Brandon Passerby, Robbie B., Thomas Pietkowski, Trip Hop and Skip, and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, if you'd also like to help support the channel, then feel free to push the buttons that do the things. Trust me, it does make a difference. Or you could even check out the PayPal, the Patreon, the Nexus GG, or the YouTube memberships. Links are in the description. This is a victory for the Golden Throne. <laughs>